Japan doesn't have a great deal of media freedom, and I believe it's been sliding down the media freedom rankings for several years. And if they go off script, they can then be banned and lose access. Japanese media weren't naming the organization which the Abe's assassin had a, a grudge against. When I did spend time at NHK, I did notice the culture of self-censorship. Welcome to Unpacking Japan. I'm Toby, and today sitting here with Phoebe. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Phoebe, you're a former live reporter in Japan, have worked on NHK World reporting for big events like the Olympics, like the Abe assassination. You've also done a lot of food reporting and kind of exploring Japan from north to south and much more. Now you're independent and still reporting a lot. So I want to hear all your stories about uh, reporting in Japan and what it's like to do journalism here. But if we scroll back a little bit, what brought you here in the first place? So I'll try to not make it too long of a story. Um, but I first came to Japan when I was 20 years old. I was studying geography at university. Yeah. Uh, I originally went to study law and quickly realized I don't like arguing, which is a <laughs> terrible trait for a lawyer. So I switched to geography and that involves social sciences and it's really interdisciplinary. And so they gave me the opportunity to apply for funding to do my research for my dissertation, mm -hmm. my graduation thesis, as it were. And in the very deep thoughts of a 20 year old, I was like, wow, Japan seems cool. It's on the other side of the world. I'm going there. Yeah, um, a lot of people have a sort of narrative as to what attracts them to Japan. And sure, things I loved as a kid were from Japan. I was a big Tamagotchi and Pokemon fan. I suppose I did Gojuru Karate for about 10 years. Um, but it wasn't like I was super into Japanese mm -hmm. culture. But long story short, I managed to come to Japan for a month to do quote unquote research, which in all honesty, was not the most methodologically sound. <laughs> so <laughs> like a one month traveling or tourism in well, Japan. Well, I did interview 38 people, which was kind of That's more intense. Than one day. Yeah, um, I went into a school, but then I actually had to not use those uh, that sample for what I was doing. Um, but I did climb Mount Fuji in someone else's shoes, literally. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? I some just kept meeting people and that's the wonderful thing when you're traveling by yourself and it's why I really appreciate solo travel is it forces you to talk to people and I joined through couch surfing actually two of my friends I made couch surfing um Japanese friends are still my friends today oh. um in fact I still had dinner with one just last week and yeah I joined this group And there was a guy who ran this wish club to make travelers' wishes come true. I don't know. We got on this bus, ended up swimming in a river in Shizuoka. And then there was this uh, expedition to climb Mount Fuji overnight. And you wait for the sunrise. But I'd only come for summer. It was August. I just had a linen jacket and jeans. That was all the warm clothes. So it's one of these stupid things you do when you're really young. And we got taken to a 100 yen store. I bought a 100 yen anorak driving gloves and like a khaki a khaki neck scarf warmer. yeah, yeah it, it's, it was a bandana it was too generous to call it a neck warmer but I tried so I went to zero degrees conditions in a hundred yen waterproof wearing the hiking boots I think of this guy's f friend next door and um, was ex extremely sick I didn't know what altitude sickness was I'd never climbed a big mountain um Oh gosh, this is getting into too much too much detail no, here. I'm just thinking, you go through this experience, you get to the top of Mount Fuji in someone else's shoes, mm -hmm. freezing, mm -hmm. and you're like, I want to come back here. Yeah, I mean, this is really horrible. I vomited all over Mount Fuji, left my mark, it was terrible. And it was climbing at night and everyone has these head torches yes. on. So I was like on stage. It was not my finest moment. And I got there, I got to the top and my camera battery died just as the sun came up. So and you I don't just, have that photo of the first sunrise on Mount nope, Fuji? Nope, nope. I haven't climbed Mount Fuji since, but somehow, you're right, I was inspired to come back. And uh, I came back after graduation for this three-month study program where we had language lessons at Nihon University in the morning. And then we were supposed to study, but 
I didn't think I would be coming back to Japan after them. And so I didn't study very hard, had a lot of fun. But then long story short, I'd done a qualification for teaching English as a foreign language. And I went to China to teach English at a university near Wuhan. And I was supposed to be there for five months. That didn't work out for many reasons. Um, I actually ran away in the middle of the night after two months. Um, they took my passport and I was stuck there illegally for about a month. Should um, I ask about this or should we just uh, skip because it's going to be too long? I'm sorry, I see I'm talking too long already. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I escaped and then I um, was dating a Swedish artist who was going to Kyoto. So I thought, oh, I'll try teaching English in Kyoto for a bit. So I went there for 10 months Then I went to London to do my master's. And then I realized I really liked Japan and applied for the Daiwa scholarship and I managed to get that, which was wonderful. And I'm very grateful to this day. It made my life in Japan. And I came in September 2014 and I've been here ever since. Cool. That's quite the journey that you've been on to kind of end up here. And I'm curious because you have a background studying geography. Uh, we're interested in social sciences, um, got a qualification to teach English, worked as a teacher. How did reporting and getting working in the news came into play? I guess I've always been a storyteller, although I've not really described myself as such until recently when I realized that's a thread that runs through all the work that I do. And I've always loved writing. I love words. And so I did some student journalism at university um, and sort of just bits and pieces. And my master's in London was in media and communications. Um, I was more interested, though, in how tech and society impact one another. Um, my initial research in Japan was kind of social psychology of the Internet as it relates to Japanese culture, oh. how people construct themselves in um, their identity in computer mediated communication environments. Um, and Yeah, I knew that I would want to do something regarding journalism or storytelling in Japan. And so as part of the scholarship I received through um, the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation, uh, they put me through a year of language school and then a one month homestay anywhere in Japan, which is nice if they can find a family. Oh. And then they find you a half year work placement. And looking at how the media landscape was changing, I thought that just writing might be a little bit limited. And so I ended up uh, joining Reuters as a video news intern and was the only non-bilingual intern who'd never used a camera and somehow bumbled along for a so few months. Video yeah. intern for a major news outlet yeah. with no prior camera background. How did you find or end up getting that spot? Um, so it was an introduction through Daiwa. So like I said, I'm very so grateful. The, the scholarship provider basically helps to find placements for internships. Yes, they, they can do. Um, um, it depends whether you already have a contact or how they want to sort of, you know, how you want to proceed and who you know. So I think one of my senpai had already been there, to be honest. Um, I'm still really good friends with the guy who was my, my mm -hmm. boss then. Um, And he really didn't have high hopes at all. I was just free labor. They paid their interns, but I was receiving um, a monthly uh, stipend. stipend, yeah, from, from Daiwa. And so they didn't have to pay me anything. Um, he just said I was really genki, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And so my sort of bright energy got me in. Do you remember the first story you worked on? Yeah, I remember a few. Um, so one was I was just helping a more senior video journalist. We went to this massive uh, building in Kobe where they build a 10 story building and then shake it to see how the earthquake damages it. And then I remember us rushing back and trying to cut out some footage and send it out. That was really that was really fun. The first time I kind of went on the road, but I wasn't the main person shooting. And my first story that did kind of okay was I went to film an artist. I also stepped backwards and knocked over part of her work. So that was really bad. But it's okay. It wasn't totally broken. Not my finest moment. But um, yeah, I, I filmed that. And that she she was great. She does these kind of uh, three, these 
hermit shell crabs and she makes little, uh, I guess it's out of plastic, what's see through. I don't know the exact material, I can't remember now. Like a city, mm -hmm. the hermit shell, the hermit crab will move into this, this shell city and wear it on its back. But I guess my biggest, the, the story that really took off, that I felt very proud of, that I finally got into this, um, was I filmed Chocolate Ramen it for in February 2016. Um, and I think it became it became the top video story out of Tokyo office that month. Um, people just love chocolate noodles. Cool. And, I mean, come on, chocolate noodles. Yeah, so how does it work, chocolate ramen? Is it like the soup, the broth that's like basically chocolate and you put the ramen in like, like a chocolate fondue or? Well, um, it changes every year and it depends on the store. So um, there's a there's a store that there's a store that's been partnering with uh, actually Lotte for at 16, 17. I don't know, actually, maybe not that many times. But the store I went to is run by Shono-san. He's a really, I think he calls himself like a ramen creator. Oh. And he now has stores in San Francisco and Bangkok. But it's not exactly a chain because each place will have a different menu. And he changes the the menu each year. So he'll create a limited just two-week um, edition. So actually, one of the girls I bumped into When I was filming that video, I interviewed her. We're still friends, and every year we go to eat chocolate ramen. So we just went back a few days ago um, to, and this year it was chocolate. Um, it rolls like uh, chocolate into the noodles, very mochiri, very springy, but it was a tantam men. So you melt the chocolate on top, but really spicy. I didn't really get much of the sweetness. And I think this year is my favorite so far. Definitely 10 out of 10 would eat again. You got me curious. Oh. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> But another thing that I'm quite curious about is the majority of your work you've then done at NHK, uh, for NHK World, where you were a live reporter on the stock exchange in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and you did a lot of very interesting stories. Oh, so I I'm, forgot a really interesting story oh. at Reuters. I know I'm talking too much, but this is one I'm really proud of rather than chocolate noodles. Can I just interrupt yes. and say, I'm sorry. I, I did a story on working mothers in Japan and interviewed Kathy Matsui about um, womanomics and the sort of the discussion regarding gender inequality and how difficult it is to be a sort of working mother or a single mother in Japan. And that was picked up by a lot of major channels um, for International Women's Day. And it felt good to tackle an issue. I love chocolate noodles, but also ch tackle an issue that's Uh, very important in society. With a bigger social impact. Yeah. So let's talk about this for a moment because we can talk about NHK later. I'm quite curious about uh, uh, the impact these kind of stories have because this, especially the topic you brought up mm -hmm. about how women are portrayed in Japanese society and how they're being talked about in mm -hmm. the media and such mm -hmm. uh, is maybe quite different than we are familiar with in the West. Um, you're talking about media within Japan? Mm -hmm. I'm, well... I think you know as well as well as I do that there's definitely the the way uh, gender plays out on a daily basis is obviously reflected in the media and there is an iterative kind of um, process that goes on there. Um, I'm not the most qualified to talk about, I suppose, Japanese media. I've not really worked directly, well, actually, um, a little bit, I suppose, through NHK. Um, but in terms of you asked about impact of the stories. It's hard to judge, at least I'm talking, I did this story you know, eight years ago now. Um, it felt good that major channels were picking this up, but also that was for a news agency. So it's very, it's quite hard to sort of measure impact within, you know, uh, overseas and how much that's raising awareness. Just from my personal perspective, I feel that the issue of gender inequality is not that uh, understood or known outside of Japan because we have this image of Japan being an extremely advanced society. And of course it is in many ways. And I love living here. I have been here for 10, it will be 10 years in a row this year. Um, but I think people's perception fixates on Japan as the land of food and technology. And as we all make the fax machine jokes, mm. the sort of reality is a little bit different. And I think that doesn't necessarily get a, a lot of attention um, when it comes to gender issues. S saying that um, when Japan's what, gender equality minister is, a, I forgot, is a guy. Yeah. And the he, one who tried to like 
feel what it's like to be pregnant by putting like a big cushion on his stomach and oh, kind of walk around. Oh, did he like do that recently? That's been around for years and years. And I think he did it again last year, if I'm not mistaken, but I may be saying something wrong. But that's uh, the, the guy we're talking about, right? Um, I, I can't remember which. I think there's been a few of these sort of pregnancy demonstrations or like crying dolls, um, which taps into my feeling that Japan likes to put technology in the middle of a sort of social issue and hope to patch it with technology as opposed to address the issue address the issue that's what i feel we can see technology being used as a crutch or a patch in various elements of society that means it's not necessarily the most uh, productive or healthy way of of tackling these issues that's my personal opinion though so as a journalist then uh, feeling that your stories could have some kind of an impact and kind of be mentioned and maybe raise awareness is this something that made you want to continue beyond that is this one of the reasons you decided to stay with uh, journalism and reporting beyond reuters Oh, so yeah, Reuters was just really the the beginning. I mean, mm. it was the first time I was making news for um, a large international outlet. And I really was just an intern for five months. So I don't want to overplay what I did there, but it really gave well, me... Well, not necessarily what you did, but how it felt for you, right? Mm. Because it, it, even though it's five months when you are uh, in your 20s and you get this first experience, it's mm. usually something that you remember and that perhaps in a way shapes your professional career. Yes, it had a major impact um, in terms of what opportunities came my way subsequently. Um, but I think in terms of also a feeling of self-efficacy, um, because I was very much the underdog, as it were. I wasn't really expected to produce anything there. But the fact I did the noodles and women story um, and that they were very successful stories um, I remember when I left, my my boss at the time said that shows what sort of um, energy and determination what you can accomplish. So it gave me um, a confidence boost that I probably needed because I was aware that my background is a bit eclectic. Mm -hmm. It's a bit random. And I was starting my career later than some of my peers. It's not that it's a rush, but maybe it's human nature to sort of look around and compare where people are at in life. And... I knew that I wanted to carry on telling stories and I've never set myself on this is the path or this is what I want to do. But when interesting things pop up, I tend to pursue them. And people had been saying to me for years, you should go into TV. And it, it just kind of, in Naturally. some ways, I feel it kind of happened that way. People started to ask me to do TV. Mm. So what was it like now at NHK? Let's talk about this. You did... Uh, reporting on the stock exchange, but then you were also like an on-location reporter where you went to report, so for example, the Olympics that happened. That, that, that was for a completely different company. That was not NHK. No, that was when... Um, so just to, to give you a quick summary of um, my reporting experience, and this is alongside other work as well. So after Reuters, I joined a production company to make uh, TV shows with NHK World. I really just wanted to make documentaries at the time. And they said, oh, sure, you can help with some of the production, but our friends at NHK World have just lost their business reporter. And they spotted you um, during a, a narration recording. I sort of interrupted and changed the script a bit um, during Kengaku. <laughs> but um, it was well received. It's why the company employed me. And it was... Um, how I ended up being noticed by the sort of head of talent training at NHK World. And I was asked to do the stock exchange reports. So I did the reports for about two and a half years, um, I think. And I started doing BizStream. They asked me to go to an audition for that as well. They overlapped a little bit. And they actually phased out the stock exchange reports. So it was actually kind of good timing. I could continue with being front of camera. But at the same time, I was helping with production, um, and scripts for other shows and I had a job for this portal called Japanese Food and every couple of months I would be given a local cuisine from somewhere in Japan and sort of budget I take me and my my camera and I would just go and talk to people take photos of the food and write about regional cuisine so that was what I was doing there and that was I for about three years with that production company and I felt that I wasn't necessarily 
progressing as much as I would like within the production company, the production opportunities to get involved in projects uh, weren't really coming my way. It was a very small company and they employed me to be international, but I don't think they really knew what to do with me. And I'd never really worked in a proper company before. I've, I've, I've done many bits and pieces before then, but also it was in the Japanese environment, although I was often just in a room by myself with one lady who lived in the UK for 10 years. So it was a bit of a strange setup. So I basically decided I would go freelance. And so I started doing more food and travel writing, but I continued the biz stream work and did a, I'm trying to remember, various projects. Um, and then during the pandemic, I got contacted by a US broadcast news agency and uh, they needed someone to take over all their coverage um, for Japan. And in some ways, well, they contacted me because they couldn't get people in the country. Um, but country also, was closed. Yeah, it would be very, very difficult for them. And it was one of these times where my incredibly eclectic background actually stood in my favor. I had live news reporting experience, but thanks to Reuters, I'd used a camera. I knew basically some basic editing skills. I knew what makes a story. I know how to write the scripts. And so I jumped in and I took over. Um, I was basically a one woman production team with, I had a, an assistant three days a week and then later, um, three and a half days a week, um, who helped me um, an awful lot. I needed backup, but I would produce two radio pieces a day, but that didn't actually count towards the work. <laughs> I'd have to pitch out um, stories, headlines, and then I'd maybe get live requests and have to be ready to talk live. Um, so I reported for maybe hmm, 25 plus radio and TV stations around the world um, during that time. So if I understand this correctly, this broadcast company from the US contacts you and basically you are their person in Japan. Mm -hmm. And since they are a broadcast network, they do have these different radio shows. They do have these different TVs and you will kind of go in the field and collect the information, be on site, film yourself, talk about something that is then kind of distributed within their network. So, so it's basically a, it's, it's largely, it's quite similar to what, Reuters or AP would do, except for with a live reporting element. Reuters did have that, I think, and then that got shut down. Um, so when breaking news happens in Japan, all the different TV stations around the world, they don't have a reporter based in Japan all the time. So I'm the reporter for hire, as it were. Um, so I would do lots of live reports there, but then also And this was the bit I enjoyed the most. I've, I'm, oh my gosh, I've done so much live reporting, but if I don't have to do live reporting, it's kind of fine with me. It's kind of stressful. It's not, I, I prefer working slowly on a story, doing a feature story. So um, three to four minute video news around a topic would pitch several story ideas to um, different networks we had relationships with who wanted content from Japan. Or occasionally we get a request, a US channel um, asked us to produce a piece on why Japan doesn't have um, gun violence. Um, this was before Abe got assassinated. But of course, that the reason, one of the reasons that was so shocking was, of course, he was a, a major political figure, mm. but also because events of you know, incidents like this are so uncommon in Japan. And so... Yeah, for the gun violence piece, I found a hunter in Chiba, sort of drove over there, went out with my camera in the woods, filmed him and his dog. And then um, my producer managed to get a guy who used to train the police in different martial arts and the sort of techniques that the police use in Japan for diffusing violence. So it made a story like that, for example. Um, yeah, so various. those stories will be more scripted and you kind of have time to write your script, write the story, find the people you want to interview and kind of put it together. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's like a, a lot of setups. So you've got to find everybody you need and then you'll interview them. You go on location, film them. I would also have to have a um, what's called like a piece to camera, PTC. And so quite often I'm just filming myself. So I'd have to set a camera up somewhere and sort of give the sort of 10 seconds because I would also narrate narrate the three to four minutes 
And the sort of point of the piece to camera is to show the viewers that you're actually in that location and make them feel more sort of connected with the story. Um, so yeah, that would, and then I would uh, get the script, send it off, get all the approval back and forward, edit it, voice it, um, and send it out. Yeah. I'm curious about the live reporting and how this works. Uh, okay. You did mention to me that you covered the assassination of Abe. Yeah. In a moment like this, where this just happens and you are mm -hmm. somewhere within Japan at that time, do you get a phone call and if someone asking you, can you go there immediately, set up the camera and start talking, say something, gather news? Like, what is the process of uh, these live reports? Yeah, I mean, there was quite a big earthquake in, in, in Tokyo, not like super massive, um, at midnight, and was it 2021, 2022? And, Like, I was like, well, I'm not going to bed, right? So you just get straight on. You, it was like, I think I was live within 10, 15 minutes um, because I I lived in my office studio and I broadcast off my balcony with a sort of viewer Shinjuku. We sort of created this. Um, Backdrop. Yeah, studio, yeah. I I went from living in like a very cute suburb to the 38th floor with this. Yeah, it was wow. quite, a, a li it was a massive life change. I, yeah, yeah. But um, so with Abe's assassination, yeah, I I actually had that day off and I was heading up to Itsunomiya to talk to a load of sake people. I'm sorry, I'm smiling. I shouldn't be. Obviously, the assassination was a horrible event. But it was just the timing was just. I, I remember looking at my phone and there was this NHK pop up and it and it's like, oh, it's, it, like they said, Abe, former Prime Minister Abe is bleeding. And I was just like. Ah, oh, Phoebe, you really should work on your Japanese reading, like, as if he's bleeding in the street. Got on the train, I looked at it again, I was like, no, I, I think I'm reading this right. Um, yeah, and so I actually ended up reporting the whole first day from Utsunomiya. So you still uh, on went the side of the to road. where you were initially going? I was initially going up. there, I was initially going there, and there was this thing in for two hours in the evening, but so which I participated in, then went back to reporting. So I only slept, I think, 45 minutes that first day. And then the, it was basically five 18-hour days, and I maybe slept four hours a day because there was so much to, to do. Yeah, yeah, it was, was very, very intense. Um, as a journalist, um, I think it was good ex good experience to cover that. I am, I am glad that I was able to cover it. Um, even though it was, you know, a very intense time, mm -hmm. but that's the sort of life of the journalist. And I think this is why I've moved away though from the sort of news environment as I've, in my heart of hearts, I'm much more a sort of storyteller, fe um, features, culture, food, tech, all that kind of stuff, travel. Um, I don't think I have that ha like hard news journalist instinct that really wants to chase down that story and be there. That's kind of weighing on you too when you have to cover events like this. Yeah, um, I've always, and this was something I struggled with a little bit in the idea of trying to make documentaries in that I don't, I like to know people's stories, but I don't, on a personal level, but asking somebody to then sort of broadcast that, I always felt this little sort of iwakan, like a kind of uncomfortable feeling about what's the sort of legitimate interest versus exploitative. And I think that's just me personally, um, because people were really good at it. They approach it with such sensitivity, but it just for me and my personality and the way I work mm. probably um, isn't the best fit. If we talk about more joyful stories, you mentioned that you did some kind of feature stories of spending a night drinking in an alleyway in Shinjuku or spending <laughs> a weekend in the mountains with a group of drummers. Oh, yeah. Um, How did that go? But this was not TV. This is writing. Um, yeah, I've worked, I've worked on some really fun, interesting things. So, sure, Abe assassination was a major news story. Um, but, yeah, this, this was a website that I think they were a digital marketing company and they were experimenting in English content. I don't think anyone really looked at this website somehow they gave me the login so I could see all the back end um and but they wanted to create slightly interesting different tourist content and I in the end I could pitch ideas and stories to them um but it was sort of 
it, it was like a little bit like Vice Light meets tra- tourism content. I mean, the editor wanted to be a little bit edgy. So my first assignment was I was sent to Iguisidani because it was the cheapest place with, the, I think, the highest crime rate on the Yamanote line. And I just had to basically hang out there all night and see what happens and write about it. So it was fun because I spent to sp- went to spend some time in um, sort of alleyways in Shinjuku drinking. I-, I went to one tiny alleyway that people don't really know about, not Omoide Yokocho or Golden Kai, and pretended I didn't speak Japanese to see how I, I got along, but then would reveal... God, someone, someone, someone got quite upset with me and I felt very, I was like, I'm sorry, they asked me not to tell you straight away. <laughs> um, and we, no, we were, we were good friends after that. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was fun to explore. I mean, it was fun to write that kind of experiential piece because I, I'm a very energetic person. I like to put myself into the story. It was good fun, but also learn a little bit about how the sort of city works and that's I think is guiding beyond of course just having fun it was a fun fluff piece I'm not going to try and read a a deeper meaning into it but learning a bit about why do these alleyways still exist and um or how do these bars or micro spaces operate what is the relationship between customer and uh like bartender or um I was in the part of town where they used to have the Edo execution grounds and talking to people and they're like, yeah, when they were digging up this street, they would find the bones from people who'd been buried from hundreds of years ago. I, I had some like track down a ghost story I had to work on. Um, and then I f- went to this pond where there was this local legend of this princess. So I started getting into sort of the history, but also urban design. And I realized that's kind of informing a lot of what I'm doing now. I'm doing a lot of sort of food tours are showing people around, but I've been getting super into, um, you know, why is this area like this? Doing deep dives into different areas and neighborhoods. And I think that's actually informed a lot of what I'm doing now. So you've moved away a little bit from these kind of, uh, let's say, international oriented uh, news outlets to kind of do your own work a little bit now and focusing a lot on the culinary scene Mm -hmm. of Japan. Um, how did this transition happen and how did you decide to kind of set up shop by yourself? Um, so I've been freelance since 2019, um, but I don't see uh, the, the, fo- the focus on Japan and its culinary culture and cuisine. I have I focused more in the past year. But I've always been interested in food. I set up a food blog in London before I came to Japan and was already sort of going around London, blogging things, not on a very small scale. And I carried that on a little bit when arriving in Japan. My story at Reuters that took off was about food. The documentary series I worked at worked on was a, a, a local food series around Japan. I had that um, writing opportunity to be one of the major writers for the Japanese food website that NHK World had set up. So I started to develop quite a deep knowledge well at least a broad knowledge of different regional cuisines and so I've always carried that on and people were asking me to write food stories about neighborhoods and then this company that I was writing for called Culinary Backstreets they do food tours so I started um, doing tours with them and then when it yeah in the past year I focused way more on the sort of um, food and tourism sector. In honesty, the reporting job I did um, for almost a year and a half, I worked, I worked myself till I got quite ill. Um, I was really overworked. I was working 12 to 17 hours a day, including weekends. And I was always on, I lost about eight kilos in weight and got like chest pains here initially within the first few months. Um, so I tried to kind of calm it down for the first, the few months, but, um, I took a, I did a little bit of freelance work for Sky News. Um, but then I sort of just stepped away from that for a bit. Um, not to say that I'm not going to head back and do TV related work maybe later this year. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I really enjoy showing 
people the Japan I love and particularly through its food. And so I've been doing a lot of that and um, it's been great, actually. So let me <laughs> ask you maybe a difficult question, but from all the experiences <laughs> you've done in Japan where you've been eating and discovering local neighborhoods, have you come to a conclusion that there's one that is the best? One area where a foodie should absolutely go in Japan? Gosh, I feel like you're wanting a contra controversial soundbite or something. <laughs> well, there's only one right answer. Right? Oh, right. Okay. Um, I can see that Toby here mm. is starting an Osaka-Tokyo rivalry. Mm. Um, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial, maybe. But I think when people, they, people say go to Osaka for the food... I think it's a little overrated. I think takoyaki are overrated. Are you gonna are you gonna hate me? No. I think takoyaki are delicious, but I don't think takoyaki is the food for which people should come to Osaka. Well, what would you say is the food? Just the general atmosphere, all the shotengai that you do not have in Tokyo, for example, that are gone but are still here. The local culture in Kyobashi, the local restaurants, the local izakaya, I feel they are much harder to find in a large city in Tokyo if you do not know where to go, but you can easily stumble upon them in Osaka. High five, sir. Um, not going to mess up the audio levels. Very, very gentle. Very soft high very, five. Very, very soft high five. Um, 100%. That's what I feel. And I don't know Osaka terribly well, but I got to bring a group. I was doing a sort of 10-day tour helping out with that um, around Japan. And I was asked to book maybe three different sake bars or izakayas in one area in, in Tenma. And then full oh, Tenma, good choice. Yeah, so I, I've got to know Tenma a bit. And actually, I'm kind of tempted, to, like straight after this, to try and go into this yakitori place I passed, didn't get into, recommended um, a guy who contacted me to go there. And he said it was fantastic. So they open at five, just letting you know. Gonna run. But um, yeah, uh, I think the just walking here, 10 minutes from the station, so many interesting looking izakaya or small shops and very easy to fill the atmosphere. People kind of warm, you can sort of bar hop and yeah, the Tenma area. I felt like I made a million friends within two hours. And so I think that's um, where the magic of Osaka lies. I think personally, focusing on takoyaki, okonomiyaki or the kushikatsu, yeah, it's, it's all boring. heavy fried food or quite heavy or fried food and this might be scandalous I, I don't think it is like the thing like no, I mean it's, I it's fine it's, it's fine to try once in a while but yes. I, I agree yeah so as a food professional kind of doing tours and looking around for things what do you look for when you want to have a good experience uh, good culinary experience or you want to give a good experience to some of the people you're giving a tour Okay, so this is um, a question that we can sort of divide into certain parts. It depends what you're, what you're doing, who your client is. And I do some private tours, but I also work with uh, three different companies. And my, as I said, my passion is really to kind of take people into a neighborhood and get them to understand the neighborhood and the people's story there. So there's always this sort of balance, right, between... Uh, this is the best place in the whole of Osaka to eat yakitori versus like this neighborhood is great. We can go and experience a lot of interesting places in, in one place. And so I feel like any of the big name, big name, famous sushi or tempura places, people can book themselves. They can get the concierge to book. So there's not really a, a point in sort of going there. Um, but definitely it's, got to be a place that's got well for me i actually think izakaya are completely underrated i think they have some of the most creative interesting cuisine um that isn't really being that widely recognized sure you know there's a lot of sort of standard ones um but i would like to see i'm going off on the tangent but i would like to see izakaya culture recognized on the extent that spain is this, like spain is associated with tapas More like uh, England with pubs or uh, uh, Italy with espresso bars. Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah, like I think 
people come and they book a lot of kaiseki. Like they'll have the whole kaiseki. Mm-hmm. The course uh, meal, right? The course meal. That's great to do kaiseki in your ryokan. But when it comes to maximum enjoyment, most people don't really, they say the kaiseki was an experience, but like sort of、um, izakaya dining, I think is fantastic. I, I like a lot of the sort of mid range. I'm a sort of mid range or even like sort of smaller, grottier, like tiny places. I'm sort of operate a lot in that space. But this year, I'm helping establish two izakaya tours for two different companies.、Um, I've actually just on the way on the train here was writing up some notes from some research、um, to get this new tour up and running. I've been asked to set up a bakery coffee tour as well. And,、um, and this is for one, through one company, one particular set of their clients. But、um, I think I will. Maybe roll that out. There's a lot of interest in Japanese bread and the coffee scene. They are booming, right? It, it's becoming, it, or it has become already like a big trend in all these very、uh, fashionable、uh, coffee shops combining coffee with donuts, combining coffee with、uh, pastries or Danish or whatever it is. Yeah. They really are doing it, this a lot. Yeah. And it's interesting because Japan was a little bit slow to. Um, jump on the sort of third wave coffee trend. So, we only started to see a lot of independent places pop up from 2014 onwards. And it's completely changed. So, basically,、transformed. when you arrived, so you brought it with you? I like to think so. I wasn't even a massive coffee drinker before.、Um, and I have some shocking confessions. Like, I didn't eat seafood or drink alcohol when I came to Japan. And now I spend a lot of time. Eating sashimi and drinking sake. And I do a lot of work in the sake space, which I don't know, I'm talking too much already, but we can、Not、talk about. So, all in all, you, your answer to the question of Where you'd like to bring people is more like bring them into a neighborhood and experience the area. So it's not、yeah. about going to one specific place because everyone should go to that restaurant, that izakaya, that sushi prepared by a master. It's more about go here and feel the atmosphere. Yeah, that's what I, what I like to do. One thing for me when I moved to Japan is I really felt that every neighborhood was the same. Because、uh, architecturally speaking, it's quite similar.、Mm. Uh, and and the, from city to city as well. Whereas、mm. if you're in, in France, where I grew up, you know, a city like Toulouse or Bordeaux or Paris or Lyon, they all have their own attributes and they all stand out. I didn't feel this at first when moving to Japan. Okay. But having been in Osaka for a while, now I really feel the difference when I'm in Umeda, when I'm in Tenma, when I'm in Kyobashi, or when I go to Namba or beyond Namba, which is like the deep south for me. It feels Ooh, very different.、Number. Yeah, I'm. There's something I almost feel a little sad about that I don't take enough time just to wander around. There are amazing things just to wander. Everything is t point A to B, or you can search on Google Maps before you go. But the joy of unexpected discovery or starting to ask people questions.、Um, yeah, I'd walked past this place multiple times in this one area that I'm sort of doing a personal deep dive into.、Mm-hmm. And fourth generation, they're up at 4 a.m. to make things,、um, but you just wouldn't, wouldn't get, to know, to get to know this. But the, yeah, each neighborhood can have a, A similar but different feel, or the way people sort of interact or move in that space. For sure, I do feel that. How would you recommend someone who's coming here as a tourist and who is entering an area for the first time? Basically, for them, everything is new. How do they best experience that going into this neighborhood? I don't think there is a, an answer to that,、um, particularly,、um, because it's going to depend on. Their personality, the area, even just sometimes I think if I'm not in the right sort of mood or headspace, I go and it's just, you know, things don't unfold in like the funnest way possible.、Um, but the way I understood Japan versus now has really, really changed. So I think it's kind of unavoidable for people to come. It's going to be there f- and not necessarily, well, they're not going to understand everything, but、um, I think just being. Open minded and wanting to talk, talk to people and enjoy the food, and accept that if you're going to go to a place where there's no English menu and people aren't going to speak English, you're going to be served something that you might not want. 
I accidentally got my parents served pig nipples in Osaka once, and it's still a, a mammary glands. My uh, it's my my dad still they they got a photo of this menu and they were like pig nipples and I don't know I I think I I I'd only been in Japan. Oh, I can't remember, but I didn't speak Japanese that well. I'd confused omakase with um, like choose your own. I can't remember exactly the details. So I thought I was choosing five, like yakitori no yakitori, and the chef was choosing for me in addition to what I was ordered, what I ordered. And so um, yeah, we got into a little bit of a debate with this place because my parents were like, we don't want to eat eat this, eat this. and uh, the woman was like. They're not eating us. I have to throw this in the bin. She threw a massive tantrum about it, and it was like, oh. But yeah, I think yeah, to try and try and eat things, even if uh, it's not exactly what what you wanted or what you ordered. You know, just we're all we're all humans. Is we there all... any specific food etiquette that people should be aware of? Um, maybe there are some things that are commonly known, like don't stick your stop chopsticks into the rice. But are there things from your experience that you notice? Uh, maybe foreign tourists have a tendency to quickly forget or to not be aware of mm. that could cause these kind of frictions with maybe a izakaya owner or something. Um, so there's I, two things that come to mind. Firstly, is trying to explain ramen culture to people because ramen now in the US or the UK, um, you go, you have some drinks, you have some starters, you eat your twenty, thirty dollar bowl of ramen. Um, and then maybe you have desserts and it's this whole meal and it's sociable. And I noticed this, Mrs. I went it was like five years ago to one of the ramen places that got Michelin star and they had big signs up in English saying you eat your ramen and you leave. But you're supposed to eat ramen technically within about 10 minutes. So the noodles don't get soggy, mm -hmm. but also because they make their money on turning the covers. It's not a $30 bowl of ramen. It's a six dollar bowl of ramen so you need to sell a lot of and them. yeah so they right that's how people make their money so sort of understanding that this isn't you know if you want to go for ramen it's not a place where you're going to sit and have a two-hour meal and um i think a lot of people don't really realize that mm. um but just from also sort of guiding people around and I, i don't guide large groups particularly um rarely um being awareness of personal space. And I feel like I took a long time to sort of be aware of where I'm standing. And you can probably see now I'm waving my hands. I'm quite, I gesture a lot. Uh, sort of just, I would say like noise levels and personal space, um, just being sort of a little bit aware of that. Um, I often find myself in a situation where I feel my companion is being a little bit loud. And I'm a really loud person, so. I make this mistake all the time or I feel like not, I'm probably being just a little bit too vocal. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult, right? Because you may have your habits. So we had the example of Spain earlier. It's quite common in Spain to be quite loud when talking with friends. To yeah. Have like, and that's how you express your emotions. But in Japan, this is kind of quickly frowned upon. If you are at an izakaya suddenly raising your voice too loud, although izakayas can get pretty loud too on occasions. Yeah, yeah, it's reading the atmosphere, right? Mm. Like if you're in Tenma on a Friday night here, everybody is loud um, and it, it, it's uh, it's a great atmosphere. So yeah, just uh, if you realize that you can't hear anybody else really talking where you can catch their words, but you're making the most amount of noise. I mean, it's just cultural sensitivity, sort of looking around and seeing what other people are doing. But, you know, the same applies sort of anywhere in the world. It's just, you know, in each area, it's a little bit different. I want to talk a little bit about uh, street food and street food culture in Japan because <laughs> a lot oh. of people have this image of Asia, generally speaking, having a very strong street food culture of you just walk from stall to stall and you grab your things. You have it in Thailand, in uh, Vietnam, you have it in China. And then you come to Japan and it's kind of missing. Yeah, um, and it's something that people don't realize um because yeah street food equals asia um but yeah it's not really very common in japan so there are 
two incidents incidences where you will find street food and this is at a, a festival or near a, near a shrine where a lot of people walk around and you'll get things like maybe okonomiyaki the chocolate bananas and i mean maybe some beef on a stick um generally um, i don't really ever i don't really enjoy anything i get from these st these street stalls um they i feel they are very much things to set up for the to capture the tourists yeah and it's quite um, overpriced too it's overpriced yeah i i felt sad when i realized i'd reached the day where i was no longer excited about seeing them because i knew they just weren't that great um and then of course there's fukuoka that's known for its yatai culture and uh i'm not up to date or like fully knowledgeable about the sort of latest situation because I know that they've been revising sort of licensing rules and there's been this tension between the sort of licensing and the process to have yatai um, versus declining numbers and people wanting to they're wanting to attract younger people and I think there is like a French guy who's yes. set up a place uh, I haven't been to Fukuoka in a little while but uh, you know I will stop by so they're trying to get younger people to sort of move into this space but it's a lot of hard work and if you're dealing with all this red tape and admin and i feel the red tape and admin makes a lot of things run very smoothly and nicely and uninterrupted um for the daily life in japan but i think it also hampers creativity and innovation and progress in certain spaces as well so i'm talking generally beyond the food scene there yeah. um so i feel like the yatai in fukuoka is kind of an example of that you look like you um want to add something i was curious because i have been to fukuoka once and i love the yatai and it's yeah. very nice to go there yeah. walking around this on an evening in spring or summer or fall why is this not more present in japan what's preventing this i mean yes administration but why are they preventing this i'm not a qualified person yeah. to say that to, to talk about that but i mean in terms of regulations, health and safety, and keeping the streets clean. I mean, Japan was full of yatai in the post-war period. I mean, it was estimated that in 1945, there were more than 45,000 sort of black wow. market stalls, the yamichi, yamichi. Um, and these grew out of a devastated Tokyo, the firebombing, and food was rationed. People really needed to get their daily supplies. And this is where the sort of these kind of yokocho that still remain, uh, these alleyways sort of originated from. And for example, people love now to go to Golden Guy, uh, Guy, what was that? <laughs> Golden Guy, um, to go drinking in these small spaces. But um, I mean, originally that was much closer to Shinjuku Station. It was relocated during a huge process of cleaning up the streets in the 1950s. Um, and there were negotiations. One area that I've just been researching this week as well, there were all these yatai around the stations and the, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government had to negotiate and relocate some of the vendors somewhere. They, they couldn't just take away people's livelihoods, even if it was technically black market activity. It was, you know, a process, a, a, you know, a process for survival, a survival method. Um, but... I don't know. Maybe the idea of, I'm just, uh, I don't know what to say, um, hypothesizing here, but I feel like they were really cleaning up the streets and pushing Japan on its path towards what became the sort of economic miracle. Like and modernization. I think, yeah. And I feel that the, the cleanup process to kind of get was practically but maybe also on a sort of uh psychological level very important and i don't know whether there is still something like you know a kind of a way of thinking about street food that's sort of dirty and if you think about how everything not everything but things in daily life in japan yeah there's admin red tape frustrations but they try to you know try to get things running as sort of as smoothly as possible to have a nice experience right from the fact that you can rely on the trains to be on time to the 10 second within 10 seconds to it's raining you've bought something from a store yes they put a little cover on it yes that's not environmentally friendly but wow the rain is not going in the bag just like the little micro details of making it sort of a pleasant experience and i feel like yatai potentially f fall outside the the mold or they're mm. thought of as more hassle 
and maybe there's just not enough support. Then they have to get space. I know that the regulations, for example, for street car, um, street cars, um, food car, the food trucks, yeah, um, are actually quite prohibitive. So of course, there's no on-street parking, um, which is great in terms of visibility and livable streets and making Tokyo and other um, uh, Tokyo a very livable city. It's actually uh, fantastic. It's got great advantages, but the you know, street the, the food trucks can't just roll up and park somewhere. They need permission from each landowner to to be able to um, sort of park and use a parking space. And then the regulations work at the prefectural level. And so if they were to then go and uh, want to sell, I don't know, sandwiches, toasted sandwiches at a location in Chiba, they need a whole separate permission from the sort of Chiba um, prefecture as well. Um, and I guess in terms of bu the bureaucracy, it's just not such a not priority, right? This, right? Not such a, but it's also not such a priority to like the, the demand. We have seen more and more, I think, food trucks um, pop up recently. So I'm optimistic. I'd love to see more. So what is in demand? Do you see any trends emerging right now in food culture in Japan? Like new types of preparing food, whether it's chocolate ramen or whether it's more food trucks, is anything emerging? Oh, gosh, trends recently. Well, we just touched on the, the coffee culture. Mm -hmm. um, t tying together something that we we mentioned with these sort of alleyways. So we're seeing a lot of these sort of large new developments try to manufacture hachiko sake, bar hopping, and creating yokocho, quote unquote. So we've seen these sort of neo, neo yokocho. Uh, new alleys uh, boom over the past few years, um, right from the Miyashita Park in um, Shibuya. They've got that um, sort of by the on the first floor. They have all these little mm -hmm. little places which I've not been to, but um, I think that's a twofold process. I'm interested in the sort of collective nostalgia, the sort of Showa era boom, like the nostalgia for um, the 80s. Yeah, um, very strong in Japan. Right, so the Showa, the Showa boom and the Yokocho and the idea that people want more casual dining scenarios where you can sort of hop between bars. And they just opened um, the new, mid, um, is it Midtown at Yayasu? And they have like these small little places. Of course you have QR codes and you can then get it delivered to your table, but you can f sit anywhere and move around in that space. Uh, the kind of like the food courts or the food halls that took off in London, you know, and they always say inspired by Singapore, Singaporean hawker culture, which is amazing. I finally went to Singapore last year. I was covering um, Asia's 50 best awards, but when it came to eating out, I was walking around the hawker stores. It was great. Um, so there's sort of that, I think, but it's also being informed by interest from overseas. So the whole concept of Gyaku Yunyu, the reverse import, where people uh, see something booming overseas that was originally inspired by Japan and then bringing it back. So it's um, kind of a no nostalgic take where the, we are now looking at trends emerging that were actually things from the past, from the 80s, that maybe the generation um, that is now setting up shops wants to bring back. Yeah, pre, like pre-80s. I just kind of lo liken the um, Showa nostalgia to how like the US or UK or many, like the sort of 80s boom, people are like, oh, the 80s, remember when? But it's young people who didn't live through the 80s. You're seeing this young people who um, didn't live through the Shaw era. Mm. I was born at the end of Shaw. Um, and yeah, it's like, oh. So there's definitely sort of the alleyways, bar hopping, some more casual dining experiences as well. Um, and I think we're still seeing bread and coffee on the up. And a, I think we're seeing a little bit more, and I, I really hope to see a little bit more creativity in terms of taking Japanese sort of kaiseki concepts and techniques and introducing uh, maybe elements from other cuisines. I would love to see oh, something fusion among those. Fusion kaiseki. Yeah, I don't want to say the word, uh, the word fusion. If you say this to chefs, they get kind of a little bit upset generally. It's become a little bit of a dirty word, but um. I'm excited for the sort of uh, for greater crossover and sort of recognition that 
um, Tokyo. Uh, I'm talking Tokyo because it, you know, it's the, you know, it's the the, the focus or the base for a lot of the culinary uh, culture when it comes to uh, international cuisine. But it'd be interesting to see a bit more of interaction in terms of also in the sake world. Um, we're seeing sake bars more accessible for younger people, for for women, and a lot of different kinds of sake trying to appeal more to modern consumer tastes it's as well. It's quite interesting, right? Because I personally like sake or nihonshu as it's called here. Yeah. Um, but I notice a lot of Japanese people my age don't particularly like it. They like to drink beer, they like to drink highball, they like to drink uh, mm. lemon sour, but not too many when they are at the Nizakaya will order sake unless they are really into sake, so to say. Is it uh, like there? Uh, is it I so mean, real? yeah, I think um, so. Sake has, you know, when they say it takes, you know, a moment to sort of like lose a reputation and like years and years to build one. So sake has been fighting against a bad reputation since the 1970s. Um, so peak domestic shipments were in 1973, and it's been in decline since then. Well, they even had the campaign right a couple of years ago during COVID to entice young people to drink sake. I don't remember what this campaign from the government was um, called, but it was quite interesting. I don't think it was just for sake. It was trying to get people to dr young people to drink more alcohol so they can basically get the tax money in, I think. Um, and it backfired because people were like, um, what kind of messaging are you trying to mm. send? Um so, yeah, that was much more a sort of a, a financially motivated move than one to rescue the Nihonshu industry. Um, but uh, from the 1980s, the, the, the sake industry realized they really had to shake up their image because it was just, it was a, considered a rough old man's drink. In the 1970s, 80s, people have got money. You've got wine, beer, exotic imports on the market. Why would they drink a kind of pretty rough old man's drink? And so we've seen efforts to continually change, um, but some people still have this image. And like, for example, if I did go to any kind of uh, like works drinks at NHK with um, some of the NHK older gentlemen, middle aged or so, and I only I didn't drink alcohol and then I drunk I drink sake. So I was just I've never drunk a lemon sour. It's just not my thing. Um, and so I would just order sake. And yeah, the the certainly the sort of middle aged Japanese men would be like, "What are you doing ordering a sake?" Um, I mean, and that's that was like threefold. I'm young, I'm female, and also you don't start with sake; you start with a beer. A lot of people do, but I think the image is really, really changing. Um, and you've got sparkling sake. There's like a do bit of a doburoku boom at the moment, um, which was considered the sort of original sake this sort of japanese moonshine as it were and yeah i'm optimistic that well i say optimistic i'm optimistic but maybe not realistic that we can see this um shift continue but a lot of this will be spurred by interest overseas so i think for the sake industry it depends on how able how it's able to market sake as something that's not just a drink for japanese food and so the work that I'm trying to do is just trying to show people that it actually pairs, has up to five times the amino acids compared to wine. So it pairs a lot better um, with a lot of foods <coughs> as um, rather than wine. And I'm, I'm not saying everyone stop drinking wine, but just the uh, sake should be drunk. You can, you could go, I, my ideal world is you go to a, a restaurant and you can choose wine or sake to have with your food and it wouldn't be considered an unusual choice. And the food could be any cuisine, not Japanese. So you've had quite an extensive experience, like doing journalism in Japan, reporting on TV, uh, writing mm -hmm. articles. If someone listening or watching this is kind of interested about getting into that, working uh, for a news agency in Japan or starting to write about food, what kind of advice would you want to give them to get started? Mm. I'm always very wary of giving advice on how to how to get started because nothing about my the way I got into all of this is a kind of traditional route um and I was lucky as I mentioned to have that scholarship and it introduced me to some people but going saying that after then after I had got my initial foot in the door I think 
you have to really be passionate about what you're doing, be interested in the world, be interested in people. And when I first went to university years and years ago to, I, I went to study law, I mentioned very, very briefly. And I got put in this environment where we were supposed to be do networking. And there just seemed to be all these people who knew so much more. And I had this image of networking as this really bad thing. But I realized that I'm very good at networking, but not because I go talking to people with the expectation of receiving something. Um, I realized that I've been very fortunate in that I've not had to pitch for work or a apply for things. Um, I've just been, yeah, sure, if I've got a story I want to tell, I'll push, I'll push it forward. Um, but by talking to people and putting out good quality work, um, people notice it and they ask you to do more things and also try and be nice and easy to work with as well, of course. But mm. I think you kind of shared something very important about... Um, networking being some something more about just being open to meeting people and engaging with people and not going in there with a mindset of wanting something from them. Um, you came here on the podcast and one of the first things you said when talking about Reuters was that your senpai at the time, he said, oh, she's Genki. And you did come here today on a podcast the same way. You arrived with a bright smile and you were very energetic to share your story and to talk with us. And that just leads to conversation and conversations. And, and down the road, you never know um, how you cross paths again with someone. Of course. And maybe there's this misconception. We've had a few guests on the podcast sharing about the importance of networking in Japan among foreigners, but also with Japanese to, mm -hmm. to establish yourself. But sometimes there's this misconception of, oh, we, I need to network. I need to hand out my business cards. I need to connect with this person, connect with this person. They need to see me. They need to see my work instead of just going out there and connect with people naturally. Well, follow your interests. And mm. if you're interested in people and or in this particular thing, you're going to connect with people. And um, I will say that if people do want to work in a media in Japan, that speaking Japanese will be a, a massive, massive advantage. There are times where I'm still frustrated that I don't feel like mine is quite quite at the level I would like it to be at, um, but it gives a huge, huge advantage. Of course, if you want to really um, dive into somewhere, speaking the language is important as well. Yeah. You've covered a lot of stories and you said you do particularly like to make feature stories. Mm. Are there any stories that you have in your mind that you really want to do and uh, maybe are on the menu uh, for this year or in the coming years? At the moment, I'm doing a deep dive into one sort of area and I'm going to be working on telling lots of micro stories of just small like um, small restaurant owners or people doing their craft and sort of just learning about their lives. I will always continue doing that. I'm working on a piece about um, gastro tourism and actually Uh, how restaurants are dealing with or approaching this sort of influx or the increasing demand um, for Japanese cuisine among visitors. Is there anything that um, we haven't covered today, something, a topic that you would have liked to share, a story that you would have liked to share that uh, I didn't get to ask you about? I've only really worked in journalism within Japan, but I'm aware that there are very fundamental differences um, and particularly One thing um, that, and this is on the negative side, that Japan doesn't have a great deal of, me of media freedom. Um, and I believe it's been sliding down the media freedom rankings uh, for several years. Um, I don't know the latest statistics, so please, uh, everybody go away and check that. Um, but they have the press club and only certified media can go to a press conference and they must ask a question um, they must ask a pre-approved question. And if they go off script, they can then be banned and lose access. And I was kind of um, pretty shocked to sort of learn about that sort of process. In terms of how um, I was operating, particularly when I was working for that US broadcast news agency, I was working completely almost outside of the regular Japanese media sphere, um, but often having to 
try and explain we don't have time to fill out your forms of like media access or approval we need to kind of do breaking news break this news in the next 24 48 hours we need to come and interview and like sort something out right now mm-hmm. um so quite often uh, the paths of access were not always as easy as one might expect or um because when you're asking large companies there's so many layers of approval to go through um can take a little bit of time uh so and what was really uh strange and i i really wish i'd actually had a team to work with when i was at that news agency broadcast news agency because i didn't have a sort of gauge of how things should be or how sh- um things should work but it was really strange that when abe was assassinated for example foreign media were breaking the sort of union church and actually saying this whereas we were all discussing this behind the scenes but japanese media weren't naming the the organization um which the um abe's assassin had a, a grudge against um and so it took a while for this to sort of filter mm. out and how to sort of approach things where it's hard to you've got a kind of like a sort of wall of silence on certain topics um that i found a little bit unsettling and i didn't have a concept of how to really go like to really go about go about um it and it also meant that with the i was taking a lot of information from the sort of news wires and i was thinking well there's some gaps in explanations or that would not fly in let's just I'm going to say UK media as an example on which and also I don't want to also say that UK media is great just a disclaimer we can all bash it just later as a comparison as a comparison yeah. you'd be like well if you're saying that you need a reason behind it or some there's some kind of gap or ch- a link in the chain that's missing whereas with Japanese reporting find there's kind of some glaring wise but it's just been omitted and when i did spend time at nhk i did notice the culture of self censorship um the people were you just wouldn't even suggest a kind of topic or thing that might not be appropriate that might be too controversial without having the full authorization to release information about it. Yeah, so this but what's interesting and I'm going on a slight tangent here is that you have this in the news scenario but also in things like documentary making. I was um working on this one project um involving these two uh elderly Japanese ladies and um they believed in being very kind to the environment and uh as part of their philosophy and there was a scene that I'd tried to put into the initial initial cut um in which the, she was working in her garden and this mosquito had come along landed on her arm and she didn't squash it or bat it away she's like oh that's just life I'll let it and I thought in terms of the idea of valuing nature and other living things I thought that was a really strong example because our natural reactions to like squash it, right? Smash the mosquito before it bites you. Yeah, yeah. So I found that I mean, of course I don't like mosquitoes, but it was like an oddly poignant uh scene that really demonstrated how deeply felt her personal philosophy was. And somewhere up the chain of decisions when um the feed well actually I was in the room the feedback was this is not a japanese thing to do um and they cut, she's and it got cut and, and, I, and I was like wow but that's but this it's not is not even very controversial right she just decided to not kill a mosquito yes yes but it's not a japanese thing to do yes. so they decided to remove it yes do you feel like there's a change in this Uh, journalism culture in Japan you know you mentioned the the Kisha club the these journalist mm-hmm. clubs that need permissions and this kind of self censorship is it still well in place or is it changed so my example there was specifically documentary making so a slightly different um, field but really i'm not i've not been working in that 
that circle. Mm. Um, so I'm not really qualified to, to pass judgment But on that. Something to be aware of when considering Japanese media, generally speaking, Japanese journalism and newspapers and how they operate. Yes, yes. So that was um, not always finding it the easiest, um, oh, of course, the easiest environment to operate in. And um, even when I was doing some of the live reporting, um, there was a time where I would need to report with the uh, one of the government buildings behind me and public road and not actually reporting on anything controversial. I can't remember what it was. And I have complete right to be there, not anywhere near the gates. But, you know, generally the police were fantastic, but there was a time where he almost kept stepping into the, sh the shot and was really mm -hmm. like being like, can I take your trying to basically talk to me until I missed the live slot. And I actually said, look, I'm on air in 20 seconds. Please, can you step out the step out the, the camera camera shot? Um, so there's quite a it's yeah, not always like a, the easiest environment to operate in. It's interesting to be aware that there are challenges, too. It's not mm. all uh, travel and food tours. Uh, you have to uh, find your way and understand how things work so you can operate properly thank you phoebe for uh, sharing all your stories and everything and for coming to visit us in osaka thank This you for was having me very interesting and um, certainly learned a lot i hope our listeners did too and viewers as well thank you for listening thank you for watching this was unpacking japan and we'll see you again next week bye